What would it be like if all birds look the same? Can you imagine a hummingbird with a duck's bill trying to drink nectar from a flower? Or an eagle with a goldfinch's beak trying to tear through the flesh of its prey? Hi, my name is Bia and welcome to the Lawrence at Home. Today, we're gonna talk about how well adapted are bird beaks. Well, before we get started, if you'd like to see more cool science videos like this one, make sure to subscribe to our channel so you never miss a new video. Now, you may have heard of the age-old question, who came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, today, I want to ask you a different bird-related questions. Do birds choose what to eat because of their beak shape? Or do they have that beak shape because of what they're meant to eat? Hmm. Well, the answer in a way is both. Birds have evolved over millions of years to have specialized beak shapes for their diets. All the birds that exist today are highly specialized for their habits. But a long time ago, and I'm talking long, around 165 to 150 million years ago, before any humans existed on Earth, the organism that would become the ancestor to all birds we know today evolved from hollow bone theropod dinosaurs. Those early birds look very different than the birds that we know today. They diversify during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, becoming capable flyers. But dinosaurs weren't the only ones impacted by the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous. A lot of bird species that existed at that time also went extinct, but the remaining ones ended up giving rise to all the birds that we know today. And now birds are one of the most diverse groups of vertebrates out there. They occupy a multitude of environments and show a lot of different habits. But in order for that to be true, they have to sport a huge variety in traits, and that includes, of course, the shape of their beaks. Now to illustrate that, I'm gonna show you a few examples of some birds. And if you've been bird watching in the Bay Area, where our science center is located, you might have seen a few of these before. Have you ever noticed how their beaks seem to be perfectly shaped for what they eat? Like how the Anna's hummingbird has a long and thin beak that allows it to access the nectar inside of flowers. Or how the snowy egret has a long and sturdy beak that allows it to catch fish and crustaceans that it gets by flapping its feet in shallow waters. Now to some examples that are not present only in the Bay Area, but all throughout North America. The red-tailed hawk has an angled and sharp beak that allows it to tear through the flesh of its prey. And the American goldfinch that has a short but strong beak that allows them to crack through the hard exterior of seeds. And finally, the green-winged teal that uses its beak as a filter to separate excess water from its food that's often aquatic invertebrates like tadpoles, mollusks, or crustaceans, or even sometimes seeds and plants that they find in the surface of the water. Back when humans were first starting to gain an understanding of evolution, the specificity of beak shape and diet was one of the things that Charles Darwin noticed in finches in the Galapagos Islands during his voyage of the Beagle. That helped him make some connections and further develop his theory of evolution. Having just the right beak shape for the specific food available in an area makes a bird more likely to get that food and therefore survive and pass on their genes to their offspring. A measurement of their likelihood to survive and have offspring is what scientists call fitness. The highly specialized beaks we see today make today's birds very fit for their environment and are a result of millions of years of evolution at work. Now, in order to better understand that idea, my friend Kian will show you an activity you can replicate or try it yourself at home. Take it away, Kian. Thanks, Bia. Now, in order to better understand how birds develop variations in their beaks, there's an activity that you can try at home. If you would like a link with the activity directions, you can check that out in our description of this video. This activity will help us better understand how birds develop these variations and how some birds are better equipped to eat certain types of foods and thus live in certain types of habitats. To demonstrate different types of beaks, we'll use different items. Here I have a spoon, 
a clothespin, and some chopsticks. The spoon will represent a beak that's able to scoop up food, like the beak of a pelican that's able to scoop up large quantities of fish. Then I have my chopsticks. The chopsticks would be a good beak to reach into crevices or cracks or small openings, maybe like a hummingbird or an egret. And I finally have the clothespin. The clothespin would represent a beak that's able to crush hard coverings on shells or seeds or nuts. To represent our food, we'll use three different items. I will use sunflower seeds, almonds, and pasta shells. So again, this activity will help us understand how having a different beak type will make a bird more fit to survive in a certain habitat where there is a certain type of food available. If a bird is able to acquire more food, then it is more likely to survive and pass on its traits to its offspring. Now that I have my beaks and my food types, I'm ready to do my activity. I will put the food in a plate and use each beak type to separate the food into a cup, allowing for about 10 seconds for each beak type to grab the food. After the activity is done, I'll be able to compare my results and see which bird is able to survive best with which food type. Results from this activity showed that the spoon-beaked bird was able to pick up 26 almonds, 12 pasta shells, and 35 sunflower seeds. The chopstick-beaked bird was able to pick up 4 almonds, 7 pasta shells, and 2 sunflower seeds. And the clothespin bird was able to pick up 4 almonds, 4 pasta shells, and five sunflower seeds. By analyzing these results, we can conclude that the spoon-shaped beak bird would be able to best survive in this habitat and be more likely to pass on the trait of a spoon-shaped beak to its offspring. Wow, thank you, Kian, and I hope that you too get to try this activity at home. So now, we have a pretty good understanding of why bird beaks are shaped the way that they do. But birds aren't the only organisms out there with beaks. Cephalopod mollusks like octopus and squid also have beaks. Even though they have a similar shape and purpose to some bird beaks, beaks in cephalopods and birds evolved completely independently of each other. They are what we call analogous structures, and that means that we cannot trace a common ancestor between birds and cephalopods that also had a beak. Interestingly enough, all bird beaks, even though they might look very, very, very different from each other, are more closely related, evolutionarily speaking, than our previous example. 
They are what we call homologous structures, meaning that all birds we have today can be traced to a single common ancestor that also had a beak. So all of this really cool information that we learned today is a result of the work of many scientists over a long period of time. Science is what we call an iterative process, meaning that a finding needs to be found again and again by many folks in order to be accepted. A good example of that is the fact that there have been countless studies on the Galapagos finches that Darwin studied back when he was developing his theory of evolution. Thank you so much everyone for watching. Once again, my name is Bia, I'm one of the educators at the Lawrence Hall of Science. If you'd like to see more cool science videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel and give this video a big thumbs up. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time at the Lawrence at Home.